Good morning, everybody. Special welcome to Patty and Frank. Very happy that you're here today. We have some really fun announcements. A whole bunch of stuff is starting up in September and also October. If you look at the back of your bulletin, choir with our brand new choir director, Jack Johnston, is starting on September 12th. It's an intro introductory meeting. They're not actually going to be singing that day um, for an anthem, but they're going to just be starting up and, 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 and meeting each other and, and starting up. So if you want to be in choir, yes, Frank? A.M., 9.15 a.m., yeah. Yep, and then the week after that, September 19th, that's when Sunday school is starting up again, plus pre-confirmation class. The ages and information are right there. And we have a brand new Sunday school teacher, Axel um, Zhang. And so we look very much forward to the inclusion of those two people to our staff. And as you know, we have Sausage Fest is starting up. Our Facebook page for Sausage Fest just got linked to Y94. Anybody here listen to Y94? We just got linked up with them. I don't know how that happened, but thank you to Kylie Johnson for linking us up with them. We think this is going to be a really fun, I mean, we're positive it'll be a really fun time. Completely outside, under a huge, large, white circus tent, just like you see, one of the really big ones. Totally outside in the afternoon and the evening. Come see me for tickets, or you can see Ron Johnson for tickets, or if you want a poster to put up at work, we have a lot of posters. And with that, let's bring all of our hearts together and do what we came here to do, which is to worship God. The peace of Christ be with you. Will you please share the peace of Christ with your neighbor? This one? And now will you please rise for the call to worship. Can you hear? God is calling through the whisper. God quietly sets before us life and death, prosperity and adversity. Can you hear? God is calling through the voices. The voices are not in heaven, nor are they far across the seas. The voices are very near to us. They are in our own mouth and in our heart. Can you hear? God is calling through the music. By choosing to listen to the music of God, we are choosing to follow his commandments.
You may be seated. I want to, I, I want to, um, in fact, um, go ahead and open up your hymnal. I want us to take a look at something, right, as we lead into our confession. Um, open right back up to 410 again. So open right back up to 410. And, and I want to take a look at verse 3, that second line of verse 3 that says, through the hymns of earth and angels and the carols of our hearts, especially through the hymns of earth and angels. I myself have never had an opportunity, at least to my knowledge, to come across an angel of God. But as a pastor, I have had ample opportunity to speak with many people, both in this congregation and not in this congregation. So both people in this congregation, in fact, very recently, just last week, a person told me a story about angelic influences, angelic sightings, the spirituality of our faith very concretely realized in the visual presence of an angel. Now, we all have different gifts. I don't have this gift. But when we come to worship God on Sundays, we are doing more than just singing music and hearing the Word of God. We are actually participating in a spiritual process. That's what we're here to do. So especially when it comes to confession. Sin is more than just the mistakes that we make. Sin is our soul yearning to return to the perfection in which God created us. Each of us were created in the image of God, and through the evolution of human history, we are where we are today. So please join me in this, um, in this reading of confession, this confession of sin, understanding that you are a spiritual being, <clears throat> that we have a soul, each and every one of us. It is your soul that is speaking this confession. Please read with me. O oh, Holy Father, yes, I hear you. Yes, I hear you calling my name when I wake up in the morning. I hear you calling my name when I'm at work or school. I hear you calling my name when I feel good about myself. I hear you calling my name when I'm about to be mean, rude, or greedy. I hear you calling my name when I'm about to be mean to myself. Hear my silent confession of sin. In ways we can never understand, we are forgiven. And it is because of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit that we are indeed forgiven people of God. Amen. You may be seated. If there's any kids who want to come up for a kid's sermon, they may. As always, kids are not required to. I know we have a couple kids in the nursery, so I'm going to kind of wait and see if I see them running. I see, I see one of them running on down. Come on up, Leander. Is your brother making it? 
He is? He is or not? Not coming. He is coming. Okay, well, we'll if we're going to... What's that? You think it? We'll see what he does. We'll see what he does. How was kindergarten? Was this your first week of kindergarten? How was it? On a scale of like 1 to 10, where 10 is totally awesome and 1 is totally bad. 10, that's totally awesome. Sometimes 1 and sometimes 10. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. We're starting. It doesn't matter. It's okay if you, need to, if you choose to stay back. It's totally okay. Well, I have a question for the two of you here. What is your favorite food, Leander? Snacks. What type of snacks? Oh, a snack? Oh, sugar snap? It's a vegetable? Holy camoly, your favorite food of all time is a sugar snap pea. Okay. Do you know what your brother's favorite food of all time is? Does your mommy know? Whoa, that's good. We're, going, we're talking about sausage all day this, or all, all month. Okay. Like sausage, not a hot dog? Oh, that's right. Did you have a breakfast sausage today? Okay, breakfast sausage. Okay. Let's see. Well, you know what my favorite food is? My favorite food is... Um, hmm, I actually didn't prepare my favorite food, but I think my favorite food is going to be oatmeal. Okay, oatmeal. Do you like oatmeal or do you hate oatmeal? What's that? Oh, okay, okay. Maxon likes it, not Leander. What's your mommy's favorite food? Megan, what's your favorite food? Nachos. I could have guessed that, actually. I've had nachos with your mommy before. Okay, here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> you hate oatmeal, right? From now on, you can only ever eat oatmeal. That's all you're going to eat forever is just oatmeal. Who out there hates nachos? Anybody hate nachos? Who does not? Who would rather have something other than nachos? I'm going to pick on Peter. Okay, Peter. Well, actually, no, 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 no. I'm going to give this one to Peter. Your favorite sugar snap peas? I'm going to give to Peter. Okay, you can only ever eat sugar snap peas from now on. Breakfast sausage. I'm going to give breakfast sausage to Elizabeth because she's sake. You are this is from the gas station. You'll love it. It's the holiday gas station. Positively wonderful. And I'm going to give nachos to. What about Joni? Okay, I'm going to give nachos to Joni over here. Then I'm going to give them to Jane. You have to eat nachos and only nachos forever and ever and ever. Does that seem fair? Sugar snap peas is your favorite, but I gave them to Peter to eat. And only Peter, that's all he can ever eat is just sugar snap peas. You hate oatmeal even though that's my favorite? Is that fair? No. Well, a long time ago, many years ago, some people tried to tell other people what they could and could not eat. And they also said that God said so. They said God said so. It would be as if God said to Peter, Peter, you can only eat sugar snap peas. Or God said to you, Leander, you can only ever eat oatmeal. And God said to Jane, she can only have nachos. Well, let me tell you right now, God does not tell you what to eat ever. Do you know why? God wants you to eat what you like and what's good for your body. 
Sugar snap peas and oatmeal are good for your body. And you know what? Nachos are good for your mind because they help you be happy. So God is never going to ever tell you that you can't eat a certain type of food because God wants you to eat fun food and really, really good food like sugar snap peas. Let's go ahead and do a prayer. We're going to, let's see, we're going to do a follow me prayer. You ready? On a follow me prayer, you say what I say. Here we go. Close your eyes and we're going to say, Dear God, I'm going to hear you. Dear God, thank you for giving me lots of food that's fun and healthy. Amen. All right. You're going to head back to the nursery? Okay. Make sure to bring your oatmeal card. Or maybe you can trade for the sugar snap pea card again. I think Elliot's mom has your sugar snap pea card. Israel, the sizes of the crowds are growing. Many people are beginning to believe that Jesus, sent from God with God's power, has come to save them from Rome. That is exactly what the Pharisees, one sect of Israel's religious leaders, have been worried about. The Pharisees are an extremely legalistic group who have clashed with Jesus frequently during his ministry. Their religion focuses on following rules, and most of these rules are written by men. They are traditions, supposedly meant to keep people from breaking the laws of God. The Pharisees have wholly rejected the idea of Jesus as Messiah, so they see it as their job to stop his alleged heresy. Matthew 15, verses 1 through 13. The Pharisees and scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands before they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that whoever tells father or mother Whatever support you might have had from me is given to God. And then, that, and then that person need not honor the Father. So for the sake of your tradition, you make void the word of God. You hypocrites, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me? teaching human precepts as doctrines? Then he called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but, is, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, Do you know that, when the, Pharisees, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. That's a powerful passage that Jane just read, packed, packed with just impressive cultural prophecies about people trying to change the Word of God to fit their expectations. All right, let's see what the Apostle Paul has to say. Ephesians may or may not have been written by the Apostle Paul. I believe scholars are 50-50 divided as to whether or not it's Paul or Deuteropauline. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Let's see what Paul says. Paul says that the gifts that God gave were that some people, some of us, would be apostles, 
that some of us would be prophets, that some of us would be evangelists, that some of us would be pastors, some of us teachers. And that the purpose of this would be to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until all of us come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, so that we all come to maturity, so that we all come to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body joined and knit together by every ligament from which it is equipped as each part is working properly promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. Now, there's a lot there also. There's a lot in that passage also. But today, we're going to be talking about sausage. Today, in all of September, we are talking about sausage. Obviously, this is because on October 2nd, we have Sausage Fest right out over here, outside. Lots of games, lots of live music, great food, great beer. So for September, we're talking about the great sausage affair. We're talking about the great sausage affair. We are talking about how the Presbyterian Church, this church right here, how the Presbyterian Church got its start, and I am not making this up, got its start from a plate of sausage dinner in 1522. The Presbyterian Church, not making this up. In fact, if you read, if you read the Monday message, I said, I, I said, Google this, Wikipedia, read it, The Great Sausage Affair, or The Sausage Affair, 1522. The Presbyterian Church traces its roots to this night, this afternoon, actually, in 1522. So, the year is 1522. It is the first week of March. It is Lent. And inside a printer's workshop, so inside a print shop, a stone's throw outside the city walls of Zurich, Switzerland, stand 12 men, and they're mingling around the back of the print shop. And, and trades in those, in, in those days were connected to a house. So they're back in the workshop area, and they're mingling around all the print boxes and the boxes of typeset and, and all the big presses that would make a book back then, and they're mingling around until Christoph Froschauer, probably saying that slightly wrong, Christoph Froschauer, the owner of the print shop, the printer himself, gathers the men together, calls them together, and he says, it's time. It's time. Now, the men were there for a specific purpose. There's 12 of them. Some of them had just finished working. So some of these 12 men were workers at the print shop, and they had just finished printing the latest translation of, of the epistles of St. Paul. So they had just finished basically a big project. They'd been doing this for probably many months, and the project is finally finished. All the little books are all set to go out via Amazon or whatever Amazon had back then. Now, other men who are, who, who, who are there on purpose, Christoph made sure that they were there, some of them are other business owners in Zurich. One of them is a weaver. One of them is a tailor. One of them is a, um, I think, is a shoemaker. One of them is a baker. And there are also two Catholic priests amongst the twelve. Two Catholic priests, one of whom is 38-year-old 
Hulrich Zwingli. Hulrich Zwingli. Now, Christoph calls the men together. It is late afternoon. The sun is setting. Again, it's March. He calls the men together and he takes out a plate of cold sausage. And he cuts it up. And the men begin passing this plate around. Each of them taking one or two or three bites of sausage. Except for Hulrich Zwingli. He is refraining because he knows that after this event, he is going to begin pressing the Catholic Church on an issue, and he's a Catholic priest. So he wants to be present but outside the fray. So he is the only one to abstain from eating sausage. Now once this plate of sausage makes it around all 12 men, At that very moment, the Swiss Reformation begins in earnest. As soon as that plate makes it around the room out of the 12 men in the back of the print shop in Zurich in 1522, with the sun going down, the Swiss Reformation has begun in earnest. Now, this does not seem very astounding to us, but we're going to soon, we're, we will soon understand why this plate of sausage going around this ring of 12 men is so important. So, the Swiss Reformation is building off of the Protestant Reformation, which was started by who? The, Martin Luther, thank you very much. Martin Luther started the Protestant Reformation as a whole. And so the Swiss Reformation, it has now made its way kind of down to Switzerland, south of Germany, down over to there. And now the Swiss are starting to kind of get agitated and do some things like Martin Luther was doing. And the Presbyterian Church, by the way, traces its, its, its roots in, from the Swiss Reformation. So what's happening right now is that it is illegal, illegal to eat sausage in March. Anybody know why it's illegal in 1522 in Switzerland to eat sausage in March? Anybody call it out. Yes, it's Lent. Now, even today, if you have Catholic friends, you know that they refrain from eating meat on Fridays during Lent. In fact, McDonald's, I don't know if they still do, but McDonald's on Fridays used to always feature the, 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 the fish sandwich on Friday for all of our Catholic friends so that they could go to McDonald's and still be kosher, so to speak. Yes, it is Lent. The church has said it is illegal, literally illegal, to eat meat. In fact, at any period during Lent at this time. So in 1522, not just Friday, but all of Lent, no meat. And the reason I say it's illegal to eat meat is because Government and churches were one and the same. At this point in European history, cities, we had city-states. So it's, it's almost a misnomer to say that they're in Zurich, Switzerland. This group of 12 men is mostly just in Zurich. But today we think of it as Zurich, Switzerland. There were city-states where the city itself was its more or less its own entity, and every city received its controlling governmental laws from the church, which up until Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the, on the door in Wittenberg, Germany, was what church? Again, I want the answer. Which church in 15, like prior to Martin Luther doing his thing, was the church? 
the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, the Western Catholic Church. So a city, a city-state in this period received a lot of its governmental power through and from the church. The two are entwined, somewhat separate, but priests and bishops and, and, and people in various levels of the Catholic Church were really closely aligned with government structures. So when I say that it was illegal for these 12 men to be eating sausage, or these 11 men, because Zwingli abstained, to be eating sausage, I literally mean that. In this day and age, you could be, the, these 11 men and Zwingli, even though he didn't eat, he was present. If you're present for a crime, you can still be arrested. They could be arrested. They were risking arrest. And if you're risking arrest, you're also risking torture. And if you're risking torture, you're also probably very much in line to be executed. So it's illegal for these 11 men to be eating sausage. Here's the Protestant Reformation in a nutshell and the Swiss Reformation in a nutshell. <clears throat> in a nutshell, what Martin Luther was doing when he nailed his 95 Theses on the board and started the first break with the Roman Catholic Church was that they were all saying, the church has a lot of traditions. It's the word that Jane used in her summary. The church, the Catholic Church in 1522 and 1517 and 1500s had had a lot of traditions. But because the printing press had recently come out, I did not research this, I'm going to remember maybe 1514, somebody correct me, 1500 somewhere, or was it 1415? 15th or 16th century, right around this time period, the printing press came out. And so what was happening is that regular people like you were finally, if you had a little bit of money, were finally able to read the Bible. And what was happening then across all of Europe, across all these Roman Catholic churches, is that people in the pews were saying, hey, Pastor Robert, Father Robert, hey, Father Robert, what you just said from the pulpit, it's not what Paul said. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, literally, it's not what goes into your mouth that defiles, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles. And so what was happening is the laity, you all, were challenging the power structures of the Catholic Church. Because for centuries, even if you could read, getting your hand on a printed Bible was extremely expensive. So Martin Luther's main thing in the Protestant Reformation was to cease the reliance on church tradition and instead focus on what it actually says in the Bible, which you can now read because of the printing press. And these 12 men in Zurich, in this little print shop, four o'clock in the afternoon, after they had gotten done with work, were openly defying the Catholic authorities in Zurich. And, and Zwingli was their leader. And after this event, he will begin a series of sermons and letters and campaigns to bring the German Luther Protestant Reformation down south into Switzerland and begin the Swiss Reformation. Now remember, I said that, that what we're going to be talking about today is that the Presbyterian Church, this church, 
and the Fargo Presbyterian Church and the West Fargo and the Dilworth and the Baker Downer. Every Presbyterian Church, what I've said is that we, are, we got our start from a plate of sausage. Well, how do we make that jump? Here's how we make that jump. Here's how we got our start from a plate of sausage. About 14 years after this dinner, a man by the name of John Calvin over there in Geneva, we're, st we're still working on city-states, by the way, over in Geneva, begins picking up on what Hulrich Zwingli had been doing. Zwingli dies. Um, they have a little bit of overlapping period, but Zwingli dies. Zwingli's older. In fact, Zwingli died in battle, by the way. And John Calvin picks up on what Hulrich Zwingli was doing and saying and pushes the reformed movement. We are Protestants, but we're not Lutheran Protestants. We are Reformed Protestants, a slight shift over. And we trace our lineage from John Calvin, who traced his thought lineage from Zwingli, who got his start from a plate of cold sausage. We are Presbyterians because 12 men sat around, passing around a plate of sausage. I hope you join us for Sausage Fest in October, and for all month, we're going to be talking about sausage. Amen. Well, from sausage to communion. <clears throat> One of the main things that separates Lutheran Protestants from Reformed Protestants was how they interpret what occurs during communion. It's their number one dispute. Zwingli's number one dispute with Luther, and Luther and Zwingli were contemporaries, side by side, having arguments, by the way, over this, what we are about to do. The reason there's an argument is because none of them have really fully understood what goes on. When we say the body and blood of Christ, if it sounds weird to you at 10, Zwingli and Luther fought over it. And Luther and the Catholic bishops fought over it. Today we join centuries of mystery. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O God. It all started with you. Everything we have, everything we are, everything that ever was, everything that is now, and everything that ever will be comes from you, O God. Through every season of change, show us how to expand your creation. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the person who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We are blessed by the perfection of your Son, Jesus Christ, who came to remind us of the changing of the seasons from summer to fall, from winter to spring, from youth to old age, from rigid law to loving spirituality. Grant us the clarity to pursue the path of true faith. Great is this mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of body and blood, of bread and juice. We ask that your Holy Spirit be with us this morning in your church, showing us that all people are loved by you. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If you have not yet done so, we do have communion cups in the center aisle. The way the communion cups work is that there is a top layer of clear plastic. If you peel that off, not yet, there's a wafer underneath there. And underneath that one is another foil layer that will open up the juice container. Does everyone have a communion cup? Let us now begin. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke that bread and he gave it to his disciples and he told them, this is my body broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you eat this bread, remember me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this cup, do so in remembrance of me. Every time that we are about to do what we are about to do, every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we enter into a mystery that men have died for and fought over for ages in their attempt to understand exactly what happens in our body and in our soul when we partake in communion. You are joining this mystery. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of our Savior Jesus Christ shed for you. Please join your heart with mine as we pray after communion. Thank you, O Holy Father for not fully revealing exactly what we do when we partake in the Lord's Supper. When we do what your Son, Jesus Christ, did with His disciples so many years ago in the upper room, when they themselves did not even know what He was talking about, they came to realize much later in life, after His death, after His resurrection, it was only then and after many years after that that they really came to understand His gift to us. Thank you that we are able to partake in this mysterious dinner. Amen. Are there prayer cards out there? I have a few that people gave me beforehand. Anyone else? Any others? Prayer is its own mystery as well. Anybody pray this week?
praying as a congregation holds its own power. Please join your heart with mine as we pray over these cards that we're about to read. Oh, Holy Father, not just in my hands, but in the hands and hearts of this entire church, we are about to pray communally for all of these thoughts, concerns, and maybe some joys. Remind us to pray every day. It doesn't matter what it looks like. We can pray in our car. We can pray in the shower. But let us always be connected to you and recognize consciously that we come before you in prayer. Right now, we pray to thank God for the return of good health to the Kratkies, both to Patty and to Frank. Very thankful, O oh God, that they are both able to join us today and be in the church family, be in the church home that they've dedicated so much time and energy. We also are praying for a brother in, a brother in uh, Louisiana, as we all know, uh, Louisiana and the hurricane and all the flooding. We pray for a brother in Louisiana. We pray for our kids, this person's kids here, whoever they may be, and also all of our kids, all of our children, old and young. None of us cease being our parents' kids. We also pray for all those who are afraid and hungry and lonely. We also pray for all animals and for all people. We also pray for students and teachers as they start the school year, just beginning one by one. Some schools started early and some are starting on Tuesday. We pray for all teachers and all students. We also pray that we are able to return safely to worship, even with masks on. We're still able to socialize and be together. We also pray for our beloved sister Janelle, who is still doing well in her cancer battle, but still needs our prayers as a congregation and as friends. We also pray continually for Jessica and Kenny and their addictions. Addiction is more than just something physical. There's so much emotional and spiritual and mental in addiction. And God, we know that especially in these situations, you're, you and your power are able to work miracles. We pray for Jessica and Kenny and their addiction. We also pray for June L. We pray for June L for her continued strength and hope and love. God, whoever June is, many of these people may not know, but someone here does. That person, that June. As a congregation, we pray for. We also pray for healing for Jean and Janice, the parents of our church member Kim. Recently moved to Touchmark, embarking on yet a new phase in life. May Touchmark be the best home for them, the perfect place with wonderful friends, great socializing. May both Jean and Janice together make new friends at Touchmark. Many other prayers, God, are going up to you now in this moment of silence. As each person here prays something that they did not want to write on a card, listen, listen to each silent prayer. God, we trust that you heard this. We trust you heard what we thought. Maybe even some of us mouthed privately. We know you heard us. We thank you. Amen. Go now, understanding that you can eat meat, you can eat sugar snap peas, you can eat nachos, and even the breakfast sausages from Holiday Yes Station. Do so joyfully and be good to your body because God loves you. Amen.